the, what promises to be another interesting knowledge cafe webinar. I'm pleased to see so many familiar names and faces. Um, my name is Joshua Gina, and I'm a policy expert in the UN Collaboration Unit, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. I work along with colleagues from UNDP, ILO, UNICEF, and UNFPA to support the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network. Um, for the benefit of uh, colleagues who are joining us for the first time, um, the IPPN is an agency network of the UN under the auspices of the UN SDG task team on integrated policy support dedicated to strengthening the integrated policy support the UN system provides to its members and other program countries. The IPM aims to accelerate the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development by enhancing the practice of integrated policy approaches through the strengthening of development practitioners' capabilities for SDG integration and acceleration, and expanding knowledge and experience on the practical applications of integrated approaches to drive development impacts and deliver on the SDGs. The network was launched in November 2021 and is open to practitioners and stakeholders from member states, academia, and civil society. In essence, the IPPM provides us a safe space to discuss and share experiences on the practice of providing integrated policy support, as well as how the UN can enhance its system-wide capability to deliver high-quality integrated policy support across practice and sectors. This Knowledge Cafe webinar series is one of the pillars of the IPPN and creates momentum to build the IPPN community and offer ongoing engagement opportunities. It focuses on building the IPPN members' capacity to understand better, a systems perspective on policy integration and acceleration, including issues that embody systems thinking on SG implementation, helping us to understand and identify how to act and interact address interconnected and independent, interdependent development challenges. It also assists us to understand integrated policy solutions, including curation of tools and resources that support the design and implementation of cross-cutting policy solutions. This is the sixth Not Cafe webinar, and we'll explore how an integrated approach to migration, sustainable reintegration and development can accelerate the 2030 agenda. We have an opportunity of tapping into the wealth of wealth and knowledge and experiences um, which the International Organization for Migration has built upon its extensive work and expertise and through global research on good practices and lessons learned, identify approaches and guidance for actors providing reintegration assistance around safe and dignified return and sustainable integration. In today's presentation, We'll hear how IOM supports states and practitioners to empower returning migrants from an integrated policy perspective by operationalizing its comprehensive approach through the Integration Handbook, which was published in 2019, and also the establishment of an EU IOM knowledge management hub dedicated to return and sustainable integration for capacity development, sharing of tools and policy practitioners with policy practitioners. I'm delighted to introduce and welcome our IOM colleagues, today's presenters, Thomas Ernst and Joy Paoni. Thomas manages the Mainstream in Migration International Cooperation and Development Initiative at the IOM Regional Office in Brussels. Thomas and his team create tools to support migration and development planning within EU institutions, EU delegations, UN agencies, and UN country teams. The goal of this work is to integrate migration across all sectors of development and to elevate migration within the UN with a specific focus of supporting UN SDGs. Thomas previously worked with the IOM Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific as a socioeconomic response officer and senior regional labor mobility and human development officer. He has previously worked for IOM in Iran and Tunisia and spent about a decade working with the UN and the World Bank in Europe, Asia Pacific, East Africa, and the Middle East. Joy is a project officer for capacity building as part of the EU IOM Knowledge Management Hub at the IOM headquarters in Geneva. She has over nine years of work experience in the field of migration in the US, Canada, Switzerland, in case management, donalizing, project management, and an E, recently focusing on my on uh, reintegration. 
So before handing um, the floor to uh, Joy and Thomas, um, just a few housekeeping um, um, rules. First, um, this session is recorded and will be posted on the IPPN page on Spark Blue on YouTube. We kindly ask you that you mute your mics for the duration of this webinar, but um, the chat functions will remain um, open and available for you to share your questions or reflections in the presentation. And as the name implies, the Knowledge Cafe really promotes an interactive discussion. So we would uh, encourage you to share your thoughts and we'll open the stage for, for, uh, for you to jump in and, uh, and share any questions or comments you might have. So over to you now, Thomas. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Joshua. And great to be here at the IPPN today and this afternoon. So my name is Thomas Ernst and I am the program manager at IOM in our regional office in Brussels, and I work as part of IOM's migration and sustainable development team, which aims to support development and migration practitioners to leverage migration for sustainable development in all communities. Specifically, here in Brussels, I am managing an EU-funded project focused on mainstream migration into international cooperation and development. And through the work of this project, we've been able to build partnerships within the UN system to work holistically across mandates and sectors, and really focusing on one United Nations, and with national and local governments to make the complex and mutually reinforcing connections between migration and development easier and simpler for development partners to spot and meaningfully reflect in their own projects and programs. So before getting into how this can be done, I first want to explain why. Why are we doing this? Why is it important to consider migration within efforts to advance the sustainable development around the world and achieve the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals? So to answer this question, I want to first start with a story about Serja. Move to the next slide on Serja, please. Serja is, is a Nepali man from Japa who, like many of the families in rural Nepal, relied on agriculture for their livelihood and for his livelihood. He had to drop out of school at a young age to take over responsibilities at home when his father became ill. To help make ends meet, he decided to move to Qatar and then Dubai to work and support his family. In early 2020, he returned to Nepal to attend his brother's wedding. And as we know, soon after the COVID pandemic hit the world, he made plans to return to Dubai as soon as possible when he heard the news that the United Arab Emirates was implementing a lockdown, so as obviously not to lose his employment. Unfortunately, it was too late as the lockdown was already in place and all flights were canceled. With the only source of income for the family taken, his family was unable to settle their debts. And when creditors started to knock at the door and demand the money that was owed, they then had to borrow from elsewhere to settle their current debts, again, putting them into a cycle of financial debt. Unfortunately, Serge's story is all too common. Serge's story, I think, highlights some of the reasons why it's important to consider the interlinkages between migration and sustainable development. So for starters, emigrating from Nepal was seen as an opportunity for him to provide for himself and his family back home, reducing poverty and inequality and making it easier to access and afford services such as education and healthcare. A lack of employment opportunities back home in Nepal was a development challenge that was one of the drivers impacting his decision to migrate. And furthermore, COVID-19 meant that he returned to Nepal with limited access to livelihood opportunities, difficulties in accessing financial services, as I mentioned, and health concerns obviously regarding the pandemic. Taking a wider review of some of these issues, it speaks to several companion compounding development challenges I think the world continues to face to this day, including the COVID-19 pandemic, growing inequality, rising levels of poverty, a climate crisis, and surging conflicts. Um, next slide, please. To respond to these challenges, the UN Secretary General has raised the alarm. He's you know, urging the international community to act in more integrated ways. And I think this means moving beyond silos and making our approaches and policies more coherent. And I think this is really crucial when we talk about migration in all its forms, whether it's return migration, you know, forced displacement, displacement, labor migration, and so on. Migration is one of the mega trends of our time. We will not solve all these other challenges if we don't consider mobility. And if we aren't able to leverage the positive benefits that migration can bring to migrants in our communities through better managed, safe, orderly, and regular migration. By integrating migration into development cooperation in meaningful and effective ways, I think we can better achieve wider development outcomes like quality education, good health and well-being, and importantly, decent work, as outlined in the SDGs. So, for example, 
investment in quality education for migrants along with communities can enhance the types of skills needed to fill labor gaps and you know gaps in the market in the labor market therefore not addressing on therefore not only addressing unemployment but also addressing labor shortages and this has wider ripple effects harnessing migration's potential can have big impacts on national growth and development and there was a recent uh, IMF study that showed every additional percentage of immigration has the potential to boost GDP growth by 2% in destination countries. So each of us has a role to play to rise to the challenge and promote sustainable development around the world. And we can only aspire to achieve this by working together and leveraging the potential of migration while minimizing inequalities and vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. So the reasons for mainstreaming or integrating migration to accelerate progress towards sustainable development outcomes are numerous, but I'd like to highlight a few here. One, it makes development cooperation much more inclusive and rights-based. Human rights are inherent to all human beings, including migrants. Nevertheless, migrants can still face specific vulnerabilities, a fact that has been recognized in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. They can be politically disenfranchised and may lack access to basic services, which can prevent them from exercising their human rights and constrain their contribution to sustainable development. Development cooperation mentions are, therefore, more inclusive and rights-based when their impact on migrants and migrants' potential contribution to the implementation of them are taken into account. Number two, I think it helps to identify and address challenges and opportunities. So there's two-way links between migration and sustainable development, but they're not always considered. In particular, migrants' potential to improve their own livelihoods and the potential of migrants to contribute to the development of their communities of origin and destination. And this can result in unexplored opportunities and unmitigated risks. Third, it makes development cooperation more coherent and effective. Development interventions in one sector may affect migration and migrants in a way that affects development outcomes in another sector. So for instance, interventions that aim to develop skills can increase, can increase emigration if suitable jobs are not available. This can in turn lead to an initial outflow of capital, which ultimately can generate remittances, which we know is the money that migrants are sending home to their families. And these remittances may be channeled towards investment in other sectors. So integrating migration means better understanding those linkages and ensuring that development cooperation is more coherent across sectors. Next slide, please. So how can we actually do this? Where can protect, practitioners, excuse me, like yourselves start? Under the mainstream migration project that I mentioned before, we have developed concrete guidance and tools to really Really catalyze action and trigger change with regards to how we approach development work in relation to migration. Concretely, our project aims to contribute to effective mainstreaming of migration, international cooperation, and development policy by strengthening the process of integrating migration into the international cooperation development policy of the European Union, other donors, and partners, and also increasing awareness and supporting efforts of partner countries to integrate migration in their development policy. So to arrive at this improved understanding, both conceptually and operationally, we developed a package of resources in close collaboration with a wide, wide range of UN partners. Over 11 different UN agencies helped, code, helped us co-develop some of these resources. So part one of our package of resources is a focus on guidelines, which introduces background information, facts and figures, conceptual frameworks, and essentially key resources to support migration mainstreaming efforts. Part two are the toolkits of our package of resources. And these contain a series of tools for mainstream migration into the European Union and other donors' international cooperation and development efforts. But it's also useful for any practitioner really looking to integrate migration into their topic of work. And these include a toolkit for general use and a set of toolkits to be used specifically for mainstream migration across development sectors, nine different development sectors. So for example, there's toolkits on migration and climate change, health and education, and tools in the toolkits on things like indicator banks, theories of change, stakeholder analysis, problem analysis, situation analysis, and so on. And you know, moving beyond the theoretical and the knowledge products, we've already piloted several of these tools in, in practice in real life situations. And we recently held a session with the European Union delegation in Cairo to support them with integration, integrating migration into, their develop, into the development priorities for the country of Egypt. We've also worked with national and local governments in Ecuador, Nepal, Madagascar, and Kenya. And interestingly, in Ecuador, the mainstream migration toolkits were adapted and localized to support 
120 decentralized autonomous governments in Ecuador with integrating migration into the four-year local development and territorial management plans. So again, mainstreaming in practice beyond just the knowledge products. And finally, part three of this package of resource is the training, which brings the content of the guidelines and toolkits to life through a blended learning approach that consists of an e-learning course and complimentary webinars. So the tools can really help practitioners from any kind of background to work on and consider migration in their work, but they complement other more broader tools that have been developed by IOM. So for example, if you are a national or local government looking to integrate migration into your work, uh, implementing the 2030 agenda into your voluntary national reviews of the SDGs, for example, then the migration and 2030 agenda guide for practitioners is your guide. And it even includes a booklet mapping specific migration linkages to SDG targets. And I think a few of my colleagues will be able to just put some of these links uh, in the chat as I'm talking here. If you're working on implementing the global compact for safe, orally and regular migration, the GCM, or you're part of a UN country team and you want to work more closely on migration issues, then we have guidance for national governments and other stakeholders and UNCTs have been developed under the UN network on migration. And again, you can find some of these links in the chat box. If you just want to exchange information with other migration and development practitioners, or just generally explore this topic further, then the Migration for Development Net or M4D Net as we like to call it is a global hub and a community of practice that brings together practitioners and policymakers from all over the world to exchange ideas, develop skills and really consolidate partnerships. This platform includes all the above guidance and more and can act as your uh, one-stop shop. These resources and tools can be used to support actors to mainstream all kinds of migration and development efforts at every step of the migratory cycle. My last slide here, slide seven, please, uh, I'm turning to the next slide. Now you have the tools, but how do you apply them? And I wanna just mention, we actually uh, just finished doing this in Nepal. And going back to uh, Serge's story from Nepal, COVID-19 clearly had a big impact, particularly on returning migrants. To help measure this impact, technical assistance under a project was provided to assess the COVID-19 impact on returning migrant workers and their communities in Nepal. So the assessment was conducted largely through telephone interviews and surveys in, across two provinces, reaching about 800 um, respondents. The technical assistance also organized a national consultation with Nepalese parliamentarians on integrating migration into the country's COVID-19 socioeconomic response and recovery plans. Moreover, the technical assistance provided guidance to the British Council on how to adapt their vocational training activities to the needs, the specific needs of returning migrants in Nepal, and commissioned the capturing of stories of returned migrants and their families and communities. It also helped to enable development partners to understand the COVID-19 impact on returning migrants and their communities in Nepal, and develop more migrant-sensitive migrant COVID-19 response and recovery interventions. So in line with these efforts, IOM has built up its extensive operational work, building upon that extensive operational work, expertise in global research on good practice and lesson learned to identify approaches and guidance for stakeholders providing reintegration assistance as called for in objective 21 in the GCM. Let me stop there. I'm pleased now to hand the floor over to my colleague, Joy Paioni who will focus in on IOM's specific area of expertise supporting returning migrants for sustainable reintegration. A particularly important type of human ability that we can harness to recover better from COVID-19 and hopefully get ourselves back on track for achieving the sustainable development goals and sustainable development. Joy, over to you, thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Thomas, and thanks for the, for the introduction as well. So as Thomas mentioned, we'll now really <clears throat> look more specifically at one area of migration, which is reintegration. And it's an area that's sometimes oversimplified or, or misunderstood, because after all, once migrants return back to their countries of origin, they're no longer migrants, they're citizens of their country, and they have the same rights as the rest of the population. But really, this process of readaptation is not an easy one, especially for migrants who return to their countries of origin because they are unable or unwilling to remain in the host or transit country. So it could be for many reasons. Um, they might find themselves in an irregular situation. Their asylum claim has been refused. They find various obstacles in integrating in the host country. Um, they may be stranded in a transit country. Um, their family situation back home requires them to return. And as we've seen also recently um, with the COVID pandemic, they might have to return because of that. 
Um, so in these cases, migrants can be assisted to return to the country of origin. And there's also cases where they're forced to return. But once they're back, there are a huge number of factors that can affect the reintegration process. So the returnee, as mentioned by Thomas, might have accumulated debt uh, for their migration journey that they might need to repay when they return. They might have um, children who were born in the host country and they don't speak the language in the country of origin. The family and the community may perceive the returnee negatively as a failure. Um, the local job market and access to services, which could have been a reason why the migrant migrated in the first place, it can still be a challenge. So there's many other factors, uh, all of which really need to be tackled if we want to achieve sustainable reintegration. So that's easier said than done. So how do we go about it? Um, so on the next slide um, is first to um, have a common understanding of what we want to achieve. So in 2017, IOM developed a definition for sustainable reintegration, which you see on this slide. So it is that reintegration can be considered sustainable when returnees have reached levels of economic self-sufficiency, social stability within their communities, and psychosocial well-being that allow them to cope with migration or re-migration drivers. Having achieved sustainable reintegration, returnees are able to make further migration decisions a matter of choice rather than necessity. So I want to highlight three main points uh, that comes out of this definition. First, that reintegration is multifaceted, um, a multifaceted phenomenon that refers to three dimensions, economic self-sufficiency, social stability, and psychosocial well-being. It concerns returnees, but also communities to which they return, and it's linked with structural factors in the external environment. Secondly, as we see, re-migration doesn't necessarily imply a lack of sustainability. What counts is whether new migration happens as a matter of choice or not. And this is also aligned with the Global Compact on Migration um, wording. Uh, and thirdly, we see in the definition that the factors affecting reintegration are not dissimilar to those that pushed migrants to leave in the first place. So next slide. So based on the definition, IOM developed an integrated approach to reintegration, recognizing that achieving sustainable reintegration requires a holistic and a needs-based approach. So this chart that you see here um, recaps a bit this approach. So it takes into consideration the various factors in impacting reintegration, as we've seen the economic, social, and psychosocial dimensions. And it's across uh, different levels, individual, community, and structural. So as you can see, it needs to be supported by strong evidence base with monitoring, evaluation, and learning surrounding all of this. Clearly, this isn't an approach that can be implemented by one organization or one agency alone. It requires strong collaboration and partnership across many different sectors and at all levels, working with local actors and national level in the countries of origin and between countries of origin and host countries. It also needs to be situated within a wider migration management strategy. So this is the framework. So how do we do this in practice? If we go to the next slide. So IOM has been implementing return and reintegration programs for over 40 years. So based on this experience gained, uh, in 2019, we published a reintegration handbook, which aims to provide practical guidance on design, implementation, and monitoring of this integrated approach to reintegration. Uh, so it's available for all reintegration practitioners in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, and similarly to the tools that Thomas presented, there's an e-course that accompanies it and a training curriculum linked to it. And so far, we've been able to train over a thousand participants in these last three years using the curriculum. So what we're seeing now, uh, after a few years of um, having this, uh, this approach of having the practical guidance, different projects, imp trying to implement this approach. Um, we're seeing that this definition to sustainable reintegration and the integrated approach to reintegration 
is increasingly recognized as a basis for reintegration programming um, and is being adopted in several countries, um, including the governments of Bangladesh, Senegal, Ethiopia, for example. Uh, we also have another tool on the next slide with uh, the EU IOM Knowledge Management Hub. Um, and it has a dedicated return and reintegration platform. So you should see the link coming up in the chat now. Um, so this platform brings together um, close to a thousand members through a community of practice uh, where it organizes regular webinars, quite similar to this one on specific topics related to return and reintegration. Um, and there's a large repository of resources. Um, the Knowledge Management Hub also creates um, knowledge through a research fund. Uh, for example, we're right now undertaking a research on debt and reintegration, uh, and also on health and reintegration outcomes. Um, we also produce good practice fact sheets, uh, knowledge bytes that analyze data that we collect through our monitoring and evaluation activities. And there's also a capacity building component uh, using the training curriculum on reintegration that I just mentioned. Uh, we've also developed a monitoring and evaluation framework and surveys uh, and tools specifically for m &E for return and reintegration, um, and as well a training curriculum on this. So all this is available on the return and reintegration platform. So before I close, if we go to the next slide, I want to go back to the original title of our session today. Um, how can an integrated approach to reintegration accelerate the 2030 agenda? So maybe one thing to highlight before we respond to this is that historically, um, when we look at return and reintegration policies, they tended to be a bit disconnected from development processes and priorities. Reintegration assistance was um, traditionally provided in the framework of assisted voluntary return and reintegration programs um, that are funded by home affairs actors um, or coming from ministries of interior. So these programs were not really originally conceived as a tool to generate development in countries of origin, but more as a migration management instrument to facilitate uh, humane and dignified return of migrants who were unable or unwilling to remain in the host countries. But what we've seen over the last years um, is really an important shift, uh, looking at reintegration more for a development angle uh, with increasing recognition that reintegration can, to an extent, impact sustainable development and, of course, vice versa. So reintegration and development experts and practitioners are increasingly asserting the need to work in the area of reintegration. And this is a shift that has allowed us to conceptualize and start operationalizing the integrated approach to reintegration with this much stronger focus on development. So as you might have understood, all this joint effort to work towards in an integrated approach to reintegration um, really helps to maximize the sustainable development potential of reintegration. And at the same time, we can build on development interventions to foster sustainable reintegration. Um, within the Agenda 2030, we see a lot of um, interlinkages with different targets. Um, target 10.2, for example, to empower and promote the social, economic, politi political inclusion of all, um, irrespective of age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion, economic status. Um, target 17.7. Um, target 17.9, just as a few examples. Um, and of course, um, reintegration features prominently in the Global Compact on Migration, uh, specifically in Objective 21. Um, if we look more specifically at the three levels of intervention uh, of the integrated approach to reintegration, um, at the structural level, um, this can be done by ensuring that reintegration support is anchored in local development policies. Uh, and we've been seeing this happening um, more and more in, uh, in different countries. Um, at the community level, we can aim to address needs, vulnerabilities, and concerns of communities as a whole, including returnees. 
Um, and at the individual level, we want to support returnees to contribute to the sustainable de development of their area of origin. So if you want more detail on this, um, the Knowledge Management Hub has published a paper specifically looking at these interlinkages between sustainable development and reintegration programs. Um, and we'll also share a link to that paper in the chat. Um, so that's all that I wanted to present for now. Um, but happy to take uh, questions and discussions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Joy, um, for your presentation um, and for your uh, really powerful story. I really, um, the story of Sergio really struck me because I suppose we all can relate with the vulnerabilities of, of migrants. Uh, we're all very aware of the difficulties uh, that migrants face across the world. But I suppose one thing we don't quite consider as much is what happens when they do go back home. Um, the, the, the stress, the, uh, the abilities to find access to jobs, the, the health services, um, their, you know, just the psychological burden of some might feel that they have failed in their, in their objectives while they are away. Um, this is something that is definitely important and, um, and mainstreaming reintegration will be really important towards the um, achievement of the SDGs, especially for the leave no one behind um, 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 task of it all. But one of the first questions that comes to my mind is, uh, is one of a, polit is a political one, a development coalition one. I'm just wondering who, who is responsible for, for, for reintegration? Who's primarily responsible for, for reintegration? Is it the host or is it the, is it the countries they're turning from or is it the countries of origin that they actually left in terms of uh, resources, in terms of um, development planning? How does it usually play out in, in reality? Thanks, Joshua. That's a really good question. And it's something that's been um, that's been shifting. As I said um, before, historically, let's say it was very much um, placed in the country in the host country. So we had many programs, for example, that were um, that were financed uh, from Europe, for example. Um, and the reintegration component is is an addition to the to the return piece. Um, and what we've been seeing more and more is um, uh, countries of origin um, taking up the responsibility of their their own nationals once they return, um, and really um, working together with IOM, together with um, with the host countries as well, um, to create. Um, um, referral mechanisms to put in place systems in the country of origin. And we see that in that way, the reintegration, um, the reintegration work is a lot more localized. It's um, something that responds really to the needs in the countries of origin. Um, but it's a huge, it's a huge effort. It's not something that happens immediately. So there's a, I would say it's, uh, um, the responsibility is a bit on, on everyone. So, um, on the country of origin to, um, of course, to return to welcome back and to have the systems in place uh, for the returnees, um, but with the assistance uh, of the host countries. And there's a lot of coordination, a lot of um, um, yeah, cooperation that is needed at, at the international level as well. Thanks. Can I just build on that a little bit? I think Joy's answer the question really, really well, just to say what I'm seeing in the, um, working so closely with the European Union as they have um, as part of their Global Europe program for the next um, five years or so, something that they're focusing called the um, the whole of route approach. So really, as, as, as Joy is saying as well, looking at the origin, transit countries, destination countries. So it really is everyone trying to integrate that together. And then just through our mainstream migration program, as I mentioned, we're going into some of these different EU delegations and really working with them to, to really mainstream that migration into the priority development sectors that they're working on and that they want to support, obviously, in co coordination and collaboration with the country governments and really taking that whole of government approach. So uh, just another way in terms of how we're, how we're looking at this and working with our partners on it. Over. 
Thank you very much. Um, here in, uh, in IP, IPPN, we talk a lot about developing new tools for integrated policy analysis. And, 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 um, and one of the things that we've realized over the past well, now six uh, Knowledge Cafe uh, webinars is that many of these tools actually do exist. They're, they're, they're out there. I was, um, I was really keen to hear about the toolkits you mentioned for stakeholder analysis, for example. I just finished an exercise on uh, analyzing some non-country analysis of, uh, of some countries that clearly were missing the stakeholder analysis, which was an important part of it that was missed. Um, but my thinking now, is, uh, my question for you now is uh, some of the tools you mentioned, uh, you presented uh, in, in your presentation earlier, how can these be integrated or how can these be used to to sort of mainstream migration and other domains, let's say the work of environment or climate change. How do you use these tools? How can they be, be sort of be used in, in, in other areas? Thanks, Joshua. Let me I'll, maybe I'll take that one first. So um, maybe I'll, I'll dive a bit more into, and I appreciate you mentioned the stakeholder analysis tool, but um, one, another one, we have sort of 10 or 11 tools in our toolkits. But let me dive more into the situation analysis tool. So to kind of, and I think it answers your question as well on the stakeholder tool. So the tools we used, in particular the situation analysis tool, we used to gather information and evidence to inform really a more nuanced understanding of, again, those connections between migration, uh, for example, uh, and the particular sector you're working on, maybe it's private sector development trade and health, and just really looking on that in the country or region of focus. So this tool can be used at the start of the programming phase. And again, our tools are applied at the different European Commission programming phases, where you can analyze the migration situation, how it intersects with the priority development sector, or in the design phase. And as much as I mentioned the EC European Commission and you know intervention cycle, I think it fits with a lot of different project development cycles used by many different development practitioners. So um, let me just take maybe a bit more of a specific case study. From a migration and trade perspective, again, using the situation analysis tool, one of our toolkits really looked at the mobile population of small scale cross border traders who typically deal in low volume, low value food, essential goods, kind of household items for sale in local markets between, you know, within border zones. So they frequently are crossing these border points, these small scale cross border traders. To give you an idea of scale, the IMF estimated that small scale cross border trade was worth half a billion dollars to Uganda alone. And it's worth billions more if you aggregate this to all African Union members. So from a trade integration perspective, UNCTAD, who is one of our partners on this toolkit, Private Sector Development Trade, is really working with the African Continental Free Trade Area, implementing the protocol on free movement in persons, <clears throat> excuse me, with a focus on small-scale cross-border traders. However, through their research, both IOM and UNCTAD are recognizing that beyond the economic impact of this mobile population, we're really seeing that these traders are facing heightened vulnerabilities including bribery and corruption, harassment, and abuse at border control points, which pushes them towards illegal border crossing points. And again, these issues have been more exacerbated as a result of COVID-19. So again, the tools within our toolkits with the different UN partners are really trying to get at some of the nuances of these issues and really pushing development practitioners to think about these things as they're developing their projects, policies, or program interventions. Let me, let me stop there, thanks. Thank you very much. And for uh, the rest of the participants, we are, you know, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to, to type up a question on the chat box or raise your hand if you want to jump in and make an intervention. Um, in, the, in the context of the mainstream migration into international cooperation development project pilot um, that tested um, these mainstream migration approaches and practice across a uh, number of countries, what are some of the key considerations that you might consider when implementing and adapting these approaches to a unique development migration context? Okay, thank you. I think that's uh, aimed at me. So as, as I mentioned in, in some of my comments, our, our project, we recognize the importance of, again, building these resources and tools with our partners, uh, the European Commission and the different UN agency, but how do we then take these knowledge products and get out into the field and really test these mainstream migration toolkits in a, in a pilot type situation. So we spent a few years piloting the mainstream migration work in Ecuador, Nepal, and Madagascar. And we, and we first began by really obviously talking to the host country, the different government ministries, bringing in the EU delegations in these countries and other development stakeholders thinking about that whole government approach and whole society approach to really conduct 
conduct country specific assessments that would help inform these pilots and really the future technical assistance that we did. So I think I mentioned in Nepal, we looked at mainstream migration uh, in terms of the returnee and the, and the and returnees after COVID-19 and really focusing on education and rural development sectors in Nepal. In Madagascar, we explored really looking at the rural and urban development sector. And in Ecuador, as I mentioned, really looking at that urban development, we really worked quite closely with a number of local stakeholders. So I think in, in one, one particular example I want to mention perhaps from Kenya, one of the more recent pilots that we're working on, we're just finishing there. It's really working with the FAO in Kenya to roll out a pilot of our mainstream migration into rural development in Kenya with the FAO, the different uh, government partners and the EU delegation. And just for me, because I've been more involved in this pilot, particularly, it's been fascinating to like really learn about how migrants and the migration dynamic is playing out. I you know so often we think about it just at the national level. And going back to what you're mentioning about number of different stakeholders and recognizing that, it's fascinating to see how migration, you know, particularly in the Kenyan context, is playing out at the local, county, and community levels. And so the Kenyan stakeholders that I was speaking to and listened with, they really spoke passionately about the topic of decentralization. And I think that's really important when we look at migration and associated policies, that it's not just being set by the national level, that when we're developing these urban development plans at county and city levels, we really look at what migration impacts they have there too. And for IOM, where we really draw on the UN network on migration, you know, a number of countries also have the UN network on migration. So <clears throat> what we were trying to do in Kenya, where we have a UN network on migration, which brings together a number of different stakeholders, UN agencies, how do we then leverage the UN network on migration to further make these interesting connections between national and local levels? So really kind of that vertical policy alignment. And again, I've mentioned we have nine different sectors. So even though we worked on rural development in Kenya with the FAO, clearly we had a lot of other issues on looking at environment and climate change and urban development as well. So how do we start looking at the synergies between the different toolkits instead of just a deep dive on, on one section? Because we know the integrated solutions is, is a part of the over, of looking at and tackling some of the challenges. Let me stop there. Thanks very much. In, in, in the in the context of supporting uh, or providing IOS provision of support at the country level, are you how does it are you able to provide this support even when you don't have country presence, or how are you able to take advantage of the UN? the UN system's country presence to provide support uh, to countries. Sorry, is that named at me, Joshua? I'm, I'm not... Actually, that was, that was aimed at Joy. Okay, pardon me. Okay, over to you, Joy. Sure. I mean, we, in with IOM, we're lucky, I guess, that we do have that presence um, across many different countries. I mean, even there are some missions that are very small with a couple of people, but that does help us to to have that direct contact. Um, and I think with when it comes to reintegration, we have, let's say, many years experience working directly with the returnees um, individually, you know, welcoming them at the airport when they arrive, um, providing more the individual level assistance and what we've been building up um, over the last few years when it comes to reintegration, because of course we, we have a lot of, um, um, we have been working on a lot of different levels of different migration um, areas, but when it comes to reintegration, we build building up um, using the direct connection, the direct, um, yeah, the direct knowledge of the needs, the skills of the returnees, um, knowing them quite intimately and bringing that up um, at the um, with other stakeholders at different in different sectors and within um, local and national governments. So it's um, I guess that's something that we've been able to do because we had that underground um, presence and uh, working directly with uh, with the beneficiaries. So it's translating that then into a larger. Um, of how do we then put systems in place um, and look at the more structural level. Um, so yeah, it's looking at that from that other perspective, starting from the ground up. It seems there are, because well, obviously the, the stakeholders and the, the actors in, in this venture are quite diverse. And how do you bring them together? How do you, what platforms are you by? I know you did mention the platform earlier, um, but how do you, how do you ensure you have dialogue with all the actors um, for, for reintegration? Are there any virtual platforms that you use or tools do you employ for that? Um, so it, um, it depends a little bit country 
by to country and it depends on which programs are in place. I think the biggest programs that are in place right now um, are the EU IOM uh, joint initiative um, programs, which is across most of Africa. Um, and there we, with thanks to EU funding, we've been able to set up in many countries um, uh, um, standard operating procedures, um, a committee specifically looking um, uh, that is multi-sectoral, um, sp specifically looking at, um, at reintegration programming and, and setting all of that up. Um, more broadly, um, because we're, we have this integrated approach that's common, it's, um, it does help to um, to have that common approach um, across different countries. So when we are able to bring stakeholders together through, um, through, different, uh, through different events, um, then being able to talk the same language, let's say, of uh, starting from that same um, common point, as I mentioned, of uh, uh, knowing what we mean by sustainable development and having this, um, this joint approach that, that helps um, and yes, through, um, through the, the Knowledge Management Hub, the Return Reintegration Platform, uh, through various um, uh, capacity building activities that we also do. Um, and yeah, and more broadly, when we're, when we're able to, um, to bring stakeholders together um, through, for, to speak on, on migration more generally, then we can, we can do that. Thanks. Thanks. Um, at, uh... In, in support of uh, local development parties, um, you mentioned the structure that we ensure um, integration support, which is, has to be lo anchored in local development priorities. Are you able to support below the national level, so, so subnational entities? Are you able to offer support, uh, you know, at, at the subnational level in terms of SDG localization? This is it to Thomas. Yeah, I think, uh, thanks, uh, Joshua. I think as mentioned in, in uh, my, just my last comments, really looking just again, going back to the clear cut example of Kenya to the, the when we were working on the rural development uh, pilot there with FAO and the European Union delegation, we saw just how important, as I mentioned, that decentralized element was to bring in those local government stakeholders um, and really bring them to the, to the table so that we could have that conversation. And I mentioned the UN network on migration, but I think another important point to mention as well is these different UN country teams. And one of the things UN country teams do that I think is so important to the development of a country is, is work on these UN United you know, Nations sustainable development cooperation frameworks, which really are sort of the sort of the guiding document over the next three or four years for that country of where development priorities are um, as a UN system, obviously in close collaboration with the governments. And so other stakeholders, I mentioned the EU, EU that I'm working with and our team's working with here are obviously building their interventions off of that as well. And what we've done in our migration sustainable development team is really try to develop a toolkit to support IOM offices to make sure that we can integrate migration elements into those cooperation frameworks. And not just migration, but the elements of migration that you know Joy's been talking about as well, the, the return and the returnees situation because a lot of times people think about migration it's very much just okay labor migration my words no it's also the returnees piece the impact on communities bringing all that into the cooperation framework and making sure all those lenses are factored in and considered is so important as well so we really try to make sure that that's built into the UNCT through tools on integrating migration into these cooperation frameworks and common country analysis as led by the UN team there over I think you're on mute, uh, Joshua. Sorry, thanks. I was just saying, uh, in the case of, um, obviously there are, there are different types of migrants um, returning for various reasons. There's some who are highly skilled, whose uh, return could be a great uh, contribution to, the, to, 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 to their countries. Um, you know, in finance, healthcare, education, technology, um, how, how receptive are countries that you work with in, in dealing or in, in, in other words, are they more receptive to working with returnees who are of a higher 
um, who have maybe higher educational uh, attainment or higher financial um, um, ability capability than people who are less skilled and you know that might require a little more effort in in, uh, in support are governments a little bit more hesitant to engage on on um, in support of of the migrants or integrated migrants who are have found to offer than those who who might appear to, to require more assistance. I guess I can go first. Maybe Thomas, you can compliment. Um, yeah, I think it is um, it is a different approach um, depending on the on the let's say if, when we're talking about highly skilled migrants, it's more thinking about how we how they can invest in the country of origin, uh, what they can bring. So it's much more um, let's say a positive perspective um, with the with return and reintegration uh, with the integrated approach to reintegration we're looking more at um, migrants as i mentioned that are unable or unwilling to return uh, to their countries of origin but what we're also trying to look at is more that link with for example the diaspora um, who is abroad and how can they also um, uh, contribute to the reintegration uh, of returnees and to the local development in their uh, communities of origin. So creating that link again, it's when we're able to work um, jointly and work um, together um, and see all the different uh, ways that everything can kind of fits in in the end. Um, I think that's the the key to be able to do that. Um, but it does, yeah, there are very different approaches and it does require a different um, a kind of way of uh, um, of understanding it. Yeah, thanks. I, think... I was just going to just add that I think just essentially it's about making sure that every migrant, uh, no matter their situation of, of vulnerability or, or, or not, that they have a seat at the table when it comes to migration governance processes in the country, that they're there. And those, those processes don't just have to be UN processes or EU processes, but even decentralized community processes, you know, post-conflict, for example. I remember when I was working in Iraq where we would bring private employers together to talk about how we can improve the linkages between the local labor market and the vocational training skills that were happening in Kurdistan and making sure that migrants' voices are involved in that. So all those different migration governance processes, making sure they have a voice is something where we obviously need to keep advocating for and pushing and making sure that that's part of it, that no one is, is left behind, so to speak. Over. Thank you very much. I understand that we have a, we have a question from the chat. Um, is there a specific SG that IOM is currently targeting um, most? I mean, I think I uh, don't want to speak for you, Joy, but I think in, in IOM, it's um, obviously 10.7 and SDG 10, but to my colleague Audrey's point there in the chat as well, when it comes to migration, uh, we see ourselves in all the different SDGs. You can link migration to every single SDG, but a lot of people do under the 10.7. Um, and, you know, I've spent a lot of time working on remittances as well. This 10.3 lowering the transaction cost of remittances, we know that's critical for, for migrants as well. So. Honestly, migration is really integrated across all the diff 17 SDGs. Thanks. Well, well, that's a that's a really important point to, to note. And in, in, since migration is so cross-cutting, how do you, you, as part of your work, do you support in terms of data collection? Do you support countries? I mean, you see clearly that uh, many, actually many developing countries are very interested in uh, the, the, the abilities of, of, of their, you know, diaspora to contribute to the sustainable financing. We've seen how the Ethiopian government has uh, developed a diaspora a trust fund um, to have a more holistic and systemic view of the contributions of diaspora in terms of not just finance, but also technology and skill set. So uh, is, uh, is data collection uh, something that you are putting some resources in? And also, have you had any requests for support in the final processes for, for countries? I, I'll go first. I mean, it's absolutely crucial, obviously, data to how we're driving evidence-based approaches to our to our work. Um, I mean, for, for example, when we were in Nepal, just to be able to do 
uh, a survey across two different provinces there with 800 respondents and really bring that information, what returnees were telling us in terms of needs and livelihoods and being able to have that research uh, available to present to government and not just government, I mentioned the British Council as well, obviously can really inform the success of your interventions and the ability to make sure that we can actually address those needs. So data, absolutely critical to IOM. Um, one of our biggest data points is the uh, displacement tracking matrix. I mean, we're using that in many, many different places right now. Uh, people are aware of the Ukraine crisis that's going on right now. DTM is super present, obviously tracking information on the ground related to, to Ukraine, but all over the world as well. So data and, and IOM, obviously it's, it's, it's um, hand in hand. Uh, let me stop there and let Joy have any, anything else to add on that. Thanks. Yes, just to add on the, the return reintegration specifically, as I mentioned, we developed uh, a monitoring and evaluation framework with, um, with specific surveys looking at um, the different phases of return then reintegration and being able to um, to collect the data through the programs that we that are implemented. Um, but I would say not just collect the data, but also being able to analyze it and to draw um, lessons learned and um, and to continue improving the programming um, is uh, is crucial. And that's what we are trying to do as part. Of not It's not only the Knowledge Management Hub doing this. There are a lot of different um, research initiatives specifically focusing on return reintegration. But being able to to bring that up and to use um, the the data collected and um, and tr changing uh, turning that into policy recommendations, programming recommendations, I think is um, is a key part of the of the work that um, that we have to jointly do um, to be able to uh, to reach this integrated approach to integration and more broadly the the 2030 agenda. Yeah, okay. I can just add on that. Just like um, we also in IOM have our Global Migration Data Analysis Center, which is, is doing some really, really interesting work as well. And I would uh, suggest uh, to practitioners on the call to, to have a look at some of the work they're doing. I mean, one that appeals to me just because I've been working in, in North Africa and Europe as well as the Missing Migrants Project, some fascinating work in terms of the number of migrants missing in the Mediterranean. And we, we see in the news about, you know, boats and capsizing and, and migrants drowning there. And often over the last number of years, it's been a forgotten issue. So one of the projects they have is the Missing Migrants Project, really trying to bring light to these issues, making sure that it doesn't leave the national attention and really getting good data on it. And certainly not just doing it as IOM, but also in partnership with other really uh, fascinating, great NGOs that are really wanting to capture data and make sure that it's in part of the, uh, part of the solutions as well. So the Global Migration Data Analysis Center for IOM is, is certainly one of our key partners too. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Um, we have one more question from uh, Nadine Bihar, um, who notes the interconnectedness in migration and gender. And uh, her question is, how do you see that in your programs? Any particular output of that? I can go first. Um, so on... Migration and gender. What we well on reintegration and gender. What we what we see with um, those that that are assisted to return. Um, there the large majority are actually um, male returnees. Um, it's I get I think usually around 70 80 percent. Um, in it depends. You know it depends on the different regions, but mostly um, it's uh, it's male returnees. So the female. Uh, returnees, um, it tends to be a little bit, yeah, uh, hidden, I guess. Um, but we we did actually a research on um, on gender and reintegration outcomes, um, which I think, yes, I see that um, Francesco is just um, has just posted it, um, and we see that indeed there are additional um, kind of challenges that they have to overcome as women often um, when they're when they're um, reintegrating. Um, I'm not sure we have a lot of time to go into it, but I, I, I encourage you to look at the at the research about that. Um, but I think more widely, maybe Thomas can can add to it. No, I think uh, that's great, Joy. I, I'll, I think what you've added is, is fantastic. I'll, I'll, I don't have any more to add. Thanks. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, we have just about a minute left. Uh, so I'm not sure if anybody else has a question or would, would like to take the floor. Um, but in absence of that, I would want to thank you, Joy and Thomas, for, uh, for, for this, for your time and this wonderful presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, this recording will be uh, made available on the IPPM page on Spark Group, but we'll also um, invite you all to, to join the, the network and to uh, check out our um, page on sdgenerationuntporg slash IPPM. Yeah, as well as sparknew.org, uh, where, where you can sign up for uh, and to receive updates about the APN and future events. Um, but uh, this conversation can keep uh, we can keep this going on at Spark Blue. You could share comments, or if you have any sources to share, um, or if you want to suggest another um, um, uh, webinar um, that could be of interest to, to, to us or practitioners. Uh, we thank you very much and we look forward to having you um, again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Joshua. Thanks, Joy. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are happy to hear from all of you. Thank you very much. <laughs>